Thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, welcome to the third um, panel, um, which uh, we've uh, entitled Singularity, Singularities Politics, uh, which is going to run from now for an hour till 12, 12.45 p.m. Chicago time. Um, we have four speakers. Um, and uh, without further ado, let me introduce the first one, uh, Marion Hobson. Uh, and her the title of her talk is, in is How Can Classification Be Violent, uh, Weber and Derrida? Right. Well, this really, can you, I, I'm speaking and you can hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's not clear on my screen whether I'm on or not. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to say that this um, comes partly from rereading a piece by Sam that I will talk very briefly about later and from partly from my own research. Um, and my hopes of what I could say in a quarter of an hour weren't well founded. Um, so I will hardly be referring to Derrida, except in the following remark to readers of, of grammatology, to any people in fact, who are aware of how apartheid was dealt with in the administration of pre 1990s South Africa. To them, the answer to the question of my title, how can classification be violent, will seem evident. The response would rather be in the words of the song, let me count the ways. One can recall or imagine so many of the ways in which classification can be violent. Now, I'm going to look at the question at a particular moment, the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, it's a time of European uprising, warfare, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, and the profound administrative changes and changes in purpose, which were developed by classificatory procedures of the 19th century. Now I'm going to pick up on one problem, how to raise a number an army by conscription and a person, a statistician, the Belgian Ketley, 1796 to 1874, who provided a kind of solution to this question of how could you raise a conscripted army. I do this because the problem has an intriguing connection to the question of the measurement of human beings. How tall, how broad, and etc. To what degree can one measure human beings when you think of them as a set of proportions? And the question that Ketley was interested in is, are these measurements more or less stable? Can they be relied on for classificatory purposes? Now I'm gonna start with an article of Sam that greatly impressed me when I heard it, again on rereading it, wartime. He read it at a 1995 conference at Amsterdam and it was published in 1997 in the proceedings of whose title is Violence, Identity, and self-determination. It should be compared with discussions in a book by Amatya Sen, Identity and Violence, The Illusion of Destiny, which Amatya published in 2006. Now, behind both these volumes, whose titles connect, you notice, Identity and Violence, there lurks the first war internal to Europe since 1945, the Bosnian War. Let's reflect very briefly on some of the issues here. How fragmentation of what had been an empire, the Austro-Hungarian, how this fragmentation goes on well after the breakup of the empire. Pieces break off, they swirl around, they recollect, coalesce in a kind of homogenization. 
And in a sense, if you've been following very recently what's been going on around Montenegro, you'll know that this is a process that's still continuing. Now, powering this breakup and re breaking up and reuniting, which is obviously a process set within a complex historical social context, there seem to exist two tendencies. First, an urge to particularization in discussions of South Slavic languages, I have overheard, there is attention to what are minute differences within what friends and colleague, what a friend and colleague, Don Rayfield, who speaks the wall, assures me is essentially the same language with different slants to its vocabulary, sometimes with different script. We've got Slo Bosnian, Slovenian, Serbian, or Croat. And here Mama might remember the phrase by Freud about the narcissism of small differences. Now, this attention to the language spoken in what yet different friends assisting on a unity old and yet questioned, persist in calling ex-Yugoslavia, becomes extremely minute and disruptive. We seem, it hard. we seem to find it hard to manage our urge to particularity and the pull to homogenization. Friends from the south of India move between four languages, Kannada, Tulu, Telugu, and English. But interestingly, they tend to avoid Hindi, which is an Indo-European language and is unrelated to the Dravidian languages I've just named, except for English, and which they, are so, they associate with different cultures and different histories. So their resistance, this narcissism of difference, is political as well as linguistic but they do seem to have in mind some kind of basis which brings them together and in opposition to Hindu, to Hindi. Their children, already competent English speakers, learn French and not Hindi at school in a submerged reference to a culture now almost effaced, but not totally effaced from that part of India, the French empire round Pondicherry. Well, as the language says, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Insistence on the supremacy of one language or the language has even occasionally been accompanied with actual violence. In court speaking Welsh in medieval Wales could currently sometimes be punished with death. But there may be other tendencies to homogenization which are less political and more mysterious. There sometimes occurs a tendency among speakers within a language to flag recognition of a linguistic relation by flattening differences and accept, accentuating similarities. And this is sometimes called approximation. I've actually heard it working. It won't surprise you, I suspect, that in the case of English, English, the factor in play which the ear is picking up is accent. I have been told that in Korean, the factor may be syntactic. You're using particular syntactic terms. Now, when you do this, and it may be more often than you imagine, you are probably inadvertently signaling something about yourself suggesting some possible classification to your hearers. Because of course, classification is useful. It offers some kind of use through simplification, some possibility of extraction of salience into a tree of head points, which can then be bent to purposes with a mess of detail and difference in the subsumed, forgotten or neglected. Historically, classification, the term, developed in two contexts, the army and taxation. 
And here I'm going to pick up what I hinted at at the beginning, the use of classification in raising an army. It was the statistician Ketelet's work that enabled the French army to work out what percentage of draft dodgers there was in any particular region of a country. He was able to work this out by the classification of recruits height. He worked in fact partly on questions of sanitation, hence perhaps the interest in height. Later in his life, in fact, he collaborated with Florence Nightingale and he was concerned with human growth and the flux factors influencing human growth. Now he developed from his practice measuring or checking measurement of graduate of recruits, the perception human measurement of one feature takes the form of the bell curve, a neatly proportioned curve round a central value. And he was able through his classification of human height as reported in an army to work out whether the reports were plausible. If they didn't form this neat bell curve, then there were elements in the set from which the measurements were drawn, say a geographical area, that were missing. Neighbourly, there were draft dodgers. So I find this rather disquieting. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's historically true. In his work, in Kedler's work, there is a central value, the high point of the bell curve. He went on, Ketele, to use a kind of violence in what he developed from this. The idea that behind such measurements, there would be a set of central values. And these he realized, the average man, who would be, he says, he says it's quite clearly a fictional being, but the notion of whom would of course help social policy. For there is a stability behind social statistics, which is very disquieting. I would use the word violent if an idea and not an action can be violent, and I don't believe it can. It's violent in the way people interpret it or use it. For the proportion of deaths, for example, or births in a country is regular, more or less. When, of course, there are not sudden brusque inflows or outflows in population, the proportion of deaths and births is rel relatively regular and even the proportion of crimes and the proportion of suicides. As I have said, this way of thinking, this way of classifying our lives seems highly disquieting. And yet, as we've seen with problems around managing the spread of COVID, it may also involve radical reductions of human freedoms. And many have felt this to be violent. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Marion. Um, now we're going to turn to our second speaker in this panel, uh, Javier Bergman, uh, whose talk is entitled Sam Weber's Response to Lyotard's Just Gaming and the elusive link between deconstruction and politics. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Sam. Um, so I'm honored to be invited. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present in this celebration. Um, so the organizers requested that I address a part or issue in Sam's work that has been especially influential to me. And in my case, that is not uh, that is not a difficult choice since there is a short and not particularly well-known text by Sam that played an important role in one of the fourth chapters of my dissertation, as well as on my work on Lyotard ever since. This chapter emerged out of my late encounter with Lyotard, who was not originally in the plan and became a late addition to the project. This means that I had to familiarize myself with his work fairly quickly. Sam was part of my committee, but he never told me that he had written an afterword for the English translation of, Leo, of one of Lyotard's central books, Just Gaming, or, or Juste in French. I was intrigued when I saw it. Sam and I had never specifically discussed Lyotard at that point, and I had no idea that there were intellectual and even personal connections between them. <laughs> 
a couple of years later, I found letters from Sam at the Lyotard archives in Paris. So this is not the last story of Sam's unexpected appearances in my Lyotard inquiries, but this is certainly the one that influenced these inquiries the most. Uh, since probably most of you are only generally familiar with Lyotard's work, given that unfortunately it has been fairly marginalized in recent decades, let me tell you a bit about uh, the context of this afterward and why I find it so productive for reading Lyotard, as well as for reflecting on the implications, on the political implications of deconstruction. Uh, Lyotard is a chaotic, heterogeneous writer, but there is a clear break in his thought after the, in and after the postmodern condition. Up to that point, Lyotard's general philosophical perspective was influenced above all by psychoanalysis and theories of libidinal exchanges. In the postmodern condition, he shifts the focus to language through the perspective of speech act theory with Wittgenstein at the center and a strong influence of Kant's critical philosophy, especially the third critique. The argument in the postmodern condition is well known. Contemporary societies are constituted by a multiplicity of language games, none of which is in a position to govern uh, all others. This is why postmodernity involves the end of grand narratives. No single narrative can tell where all the different discourses that constitute society are heading. Uh, chess gaming, or juste, appeared in 1979, the same year as the postmodern condition. It is a dialogue between Lyotard and Jean-Luc Devot, which took place in seven sessions. In it, Lyotard clarifies and further develops many of the, many of the ideas presented in the postmodern condition. Importantly, Lyotard is more willing here to engage with the ethical political implications of the idea of postmodernity. This is the target of Sam's critique, as we will see. According to Lyotard, postmodernity, or what he more often calls paganism in chess gaming, leads to a new conception of justice conceived as respect for the, differ for the difference between language games. Let me, read, let me read two quotations that illustrate this point and which, are at the, and, and which are the focus of Sam's critique. First quotation by Lyotard. The idea of justice will consist in preserving the purity of each game, that is, for example, in ensuring that the discourse of truth be considered as a specific language game, that narration be played by its specific rules. Second quotation, any attempt to state the law, for example, to place oneself in the position of the enunciator of the universal prescription is obviously infatuation itself, an absolute injustice in point of fact. You all probably noticed the tension between these two statements. Devot points it out in a jokingly way at the, end of the, um, at the end of the dialogue with his comment that, I quote Devot, uh, here you're talking like the great prescriber himself and laughter between parentheses. And that's the end of just gaming. So Sam in the afterward is interested in this laughter which is the point of departure of his response because he takes it, the laughter, as an indication of a fundamental problem in Lyotard's understanding of language games and their interrelation. The problem is not only the more obvious one, namely that the universal prescription not to infringe upon rules, upon the rules of a language game seems to infringe upon the particularity of all language games, at least this one prescription would require a meta language. The more fundamental and less evident problem is that the limits between language games are in themselves part of the game, which means that there is no possible prescription to preserve them. The two problems are interrelated and Sam moves from the first more evident one to the second more fundamental. Let me read two quotations on each of the issues, two quotations uh, from Sam's afterward. The first quotation, which I remember citing in my dissertation, um, by prescribing that no game, especially not that of prescription, should dominate the others, one is doing exactly what it is simultaneously claimed is being avoided. One is dominating the other games in order to protect them from domination. Second quotation. The agonistic field, according to Nietzsche, 
and I should clarify that Sam develops the afterword uh, through a large extent, um, through a reading of Nietzsche, to a large extent, to a large extent through a, neither, through a reading of Nietzsche. Um, so the second quotation is, the agonistic field, according to Nietzsche, is determined not in relation to the multiplicity of singular games it is supposed to harbor, but rather in relation to an exteriority that is at the same time its own product, the victors. Otherness, then, is not to be sought between games that are supposed to be essentially self-identical, but within the games as such. This quotation is very important, I believe, because it contains what could be seen as a deconstructive critique of Lyotard. Now, there is a lot to say about the relationship between Lyotard and deconstruction in general and to Derrida in particular. Let, let me just point out that there was a close proximity after Lyotard's decisive turn to language in the postmodern condition. The important point I wish to stress is that, in my view, Lyotard is the most deconstructive political thinker at the time. He's deconstructive because he takes linguistic difference as a fundamental condition underlying any relation and thus underlying anything that is. The meaning of any phrase is determined by another phrase and thus to infinity. There is no phrase that is not in relation to another phrase. But unlike Derrida, whose thought emerges in response to questions of textual interpretation, Lyotard puts politics always at the center. Linguistic difference involves struggle, for each phrase comes from a specific discourse, and its very happening involves the silencing of other discourses. Lyotard is interested in this inherently political experience that is constitutive of language. As he, points, as he puts it in the postmodern condition, to speak is to fight. But Lyotard's conception of linguistic difference is different from Derrida's and from Sam's. Lyotard's point of departure is the existence of different kinds of phrases, or what he calls phrase regimes. Phrases are always of a specific kind, descriptive, imperative, interrogative, narrative, technical. Perhaps there is an infinite number. Genres of discourse organize these phrase regimes into specific modes of linkage. Science, ethics, philosophy, narrations, and so on giving us rules for linking different kinds of phrases with one another. Phrase regimes and, and genres of discourse are given and encounter one another. This is, what Sam, um, this is what Sam puts into question. Discourses are not given prior to their encounter. What counts as part of a discourse is determined by its exclusion of another discourse. There is no science so for example, there is no science without the scientists excluding aesthetic considerations from their genre, indeed deciding what counts as scientific and what does not. This is Sam's point. By taking the conflict between the rules of each genre as a point of departure, Lyotard forgets that what counts as the rule of a genre is already part of the struggle to determine the boundary between genres. The game is not only between discourses, but also within them. This is an important critique of Lyotard that points to a possible response to what I call the elusive link between deconstruction and politics. Scholars have noted that deconstruction is often disappointing or even frustrating for political theorists because it is difficult to associate it with any political program or even orientation. The inexhaustible commitment to the identification and mobilization of difference and relation characteristic of Derrida's text seems to ruin the possibility of any political enterprise. But if following Sam, we, re we read the construction along the lines of Nietzsche's agonistic conception of identity, we may say that any phrase, any move in the game involves not only a silencing of the other parties or discourses, but also the constitution of the parties or the discourses themselves. This is why no one can guard over the boundaries between games. The boundaries are in constant displacement, so any attempt to fix them is but another move in the game. So what kind of ethical political implication follows from Sam's response? Does the response reinforce the elusiveness of politics characteristic of deconstruction? Not necessarily. By implicitly suggesting a link between deconstruction and Nietzsche around the problem of discursive heterogeneity, Sam points to an agonism of discursive formations. 
According to this agonism, these forces are in constant struggle with one another, not however because the rules are different as Lyotard suggests, but rather, but rather because it is only by means of the struggle that they can determine the rules. Given that discourses are always constituted in the game, the only prohibition would be to attempt to end the game. The legitimation of this prohibition would be ontological, so to speak. There is no being outside of the game, so by implication, ending the game entails ending everything that is. A deconstructive politics would be a politics that detects sites where discourses attempt to freeze the game so as to expose relations and responses that remain silenced until that point. Whenever a discourse acts as if it mastered its own rules, a necessary illusion perhaps, another silenced discourse may respond by showing that these rules, these rules exclude and repress possibilities. I don't know to what extent Lyotard took Sam's response into consideration in his later writings, but in any case, it is clear that Sam's critique was part of a constellation of problems that Lyotard took into account. Um, I can't go into detail here. I will just say that Lyotard remained more directly political in the sense of looking for some universal political orientation that stems from radical pluralism. That's his consistent interest in Kant's remarks on the French Revolution, Lyotard's interest. Sam's response moves in a direction that I would call more micro-political. It is a politics of inherently local responses distrustful of universal injunctions. Sam's afterwards certainly does not exhaust the issue, it doesn't try to, but when I read it, it struck me, and it still does, as a concise yet very illuminating political intervention at the intersection between theoretical perspectives, each pointing to a distinct political vision. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, our uh, next speaker is um, my co-host, um, James Martel, whose talk is entitled Singularity and the Commandment, Another Form of Law. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank and thank you. Well, thank you, Julia. Anyway, thanks to Jorg and to Peter, and of course, especially to Sam. Um, I took this as an opportunity to think in constellation with you, Sam. So uh, uh, let's see how what you think. In in thinking about Sam's uh, years of working on the question of singularity, I am struck by the way that he what he describes really helps me to better understand a well-known passage from Benjamin's Critique of Violence that I have always loved and which I have always suspected held more than I was perceiving in it. The passage in question comes towards the end of the essay when Benjamin is discussing divine violence. He tells us that in terms of our relationship to God and to God's commandments, it might seem as if the commandment thou shalt not kill is fairly straightforward. Yet in fact it is not. Embellishing on this, Benjamin writes, quote, neither divine judgment nor the grounds for this judgment can be known in advance. Those who base the condemnation of all violent killing of one person by another on the commandment are therefore mistaken. It exists not as a criterion of judgment, but as a guideline for the actions of persons or communities who have to wrestle with it in solitude and in exceptional cases to take on themselves the responsibility of ignoring it." Unquote. As I've always read this passage, it indicates to me that human beings are not completely bereft of divine guidance but that that guidance itself must never be more than a guideline, something that human decision makers can encounter and factor into their decisions, but which they can also ignore. Actually, the original German uh, term, Abzusein, uh, which is translated as ignore, more, probably more literally means turn your back on, and is therefore even more uh, forceful than the translation I've used. Yet this understanding of Benjamin's passage strikes me as somewhat shallow, <clears throat> if only because it raises as many questions as it answers. Does each encounter with the commandment look the same? Does the force of the commandment remain whether or not it is heeded? And when it is not heeded, when it is ignored or abandoned, what relationship do human communities have with it then? Benjamin himself reminds us that the Jews understood, for example, that killing in self-defense was allowed despite the seemingly clear meaning of the commandment. So there is a way to engage with, but not be determined with this commandment. Yet if so, what is the power of that commandment that makes it more than something like a suggestion? As I read him, Sam's description of singularity helps to clarify what Benjamin might've had in mind here. 
Pham tells us that singularity is first of all apparetic, which means that it cannot be perfectly defined, must, but must on some level be felt or experienced. It has an excess that is not contained within language. If we take this commandment itself as a singularity, this insight already seems very helpful to me insofar as it helps us not to take this commandment as a purely linguistic event. In other words, the textual existence of the commandment is not all that the commandment is or does. It's also a marker, perhaps, of the notion of divine violence itself. It suggests that this commandment holds open a space, but nothing more, a space in which the commandment expands rather than contracts the zone of human decision. The commandment is there not to demand, but to form a kind of envelope that breaks into the realm of mythic violence, creating a rupture in its otherwise totalizing substitution for reality and permitting another form of judgment and decision in its stead. And this takes place not in some ethereal abstract realm, but in the realm of lived experience. In a sense, the pure abstraction of the commandment allows by contrast, a very tangible and material form of decision. Now, I know that Sam's manuscript on singularity is still forthcoming. And I know there he really lays out the nature of this concept, the way it works, the way it affects poetry, politics, law, and philosophy. But even in earlier works, Sam has laid out an understanding of the concept of singularity that helps to me to illuminate Benjamin's passage cited above. Perhaps most appropriately in his book on Benjamin's abilities, Sam shows how the reading of singularity could be brought to bear onto Benjamin's thinking more generally, and for my purposes on his discussion of the commandment more specifically. In that book, Sam talks about the quote, emergence of the singular through iterations that are transformative rather than simply recursive. The singular emerges through iteration as that which precisely is not the same, which does not fit in, unquote. So here we get a clearer sense of the way that singularity works when understood in this case as the commandment. Each time we come upon the commandment, it is an iteration of itself. But each time that iteration produces transformative rather than recursive results. This means that rather than serve as a source of precedent, i.e. because you have made this decision before, you are bound to make it in the same way again, the commandment demands, if it can be said to demand anything at all, a difference, a non-identity to the prior decision or set of decisions. This is very much in keeping with the way that I read divine violence more generally as both a demand, but also a possibility for human decision that does not merely conform to the lives of mythic violence. This is not to say that the commandment demands truth from human beings. For Benjamin, only God is true, and the way that the commandment itself is true is utterly lost to us. Rather than demand truth from us then, the commandment merely demands, but also at the same time permits and even enables our own decision about what we hold to be true. As opposed to mythic violence, which is constantly projected onto God, nature, screen, and other kinds of screens, Oh, it constantly projects onto those things its own agenda, which comes to us in disembodied and false truths. The commandment instead disables and sweeps away these untruths to give us a chance to make our own separate and collective decisions. What this means in practice is that each time a community comes upon a question like, may we kill, the divine answer is always, thou shalt not kill. This tells us that we can't turn to God for a justification. If we do kill, it is entirely on us. It is our sole responsibility and decision. I imagine in such a case, the killing, the act of killing, which is usually, that is to say, under conditions of mythic violence, always justified by some great outside other, be it God or nature or reason or whatever, would become far more difficult and far more burdensome. The responsibility is shifted to our collective and individual shoulders alone. It also means that each time we come upon this and other questions, it would be as if for the first time, we couldn't say, well, this is the way we've always done it. The responsibility for the decision would be entirely on us in that moment and not just then, but always. In his same book on, on Benjamin's abilities, Sam tells us that, quote, like the pure, the singular is purely relational, unquote. I take this to mean that the singular never occurs in a vacuum, but is always engaged with some particular moment, some time and some space. As I see it, this too helps us to understand how the singularity works when it's understood as the, as the commandment. The decision is never about itself alone. It always comes into a particular time and space with a certain history, a certain tradition, and a certain relation among the actors who have to make the decision. 
This too, I think is vital because it tells us that unlike the disembodied way that decisions are made under conditions of mythic violence, where we can say things like God told me to do that, or I was just following orders, or this was the natural thing to do and so forth. Decisions made under the commandment as a singularity are entirely about their context. This particular moment versus all other moments, this particular place versus all other place, places, and this particular set of relations versus all other relations. It locates and anchors the decision in such a context and as such guarantees that each iteration of the singularity will be different from all others. This is a singularity that is always plural to itself as Sam reminds us. By way of conclusion, I'd like to spend a little bit of time thinking about what this illumination of singularity when taken as a commandment tells us about the nature of law or rather what other kind of law emerges when we think about the commandment in this way. Since the critique of violence is itself all about law, it makes sense to me to read it through Sam's intervention, offering us some understanding of how law works both in its mythic form, which is what Benjamin describes through the pages of the essay, and how that form can be broken and altered or transformed to use Sam's own language. I probably don't need to spend any time describing how law operates under conditions of mythic violence for this audience. Benjamin is attacking this notion directly in his claim that the commandment, thou shalt not kill, operates against mythic conceptions of law. Since these mythic conceptions are in, effect, are in effect based on the idea of God's rule, even in a secularized form, it is immensely subversive on Benjamin's part to have God's commandment serve as the basis for the undoing of this conception. And not just any commandment, but in a sense, the commandment when it comes to questions of God's authority, insofar as killing is the acme of how mythic violence affirms itself. What other forms of law emerges then from reading the commandment through the constellation of ben Benjamin's passage and Sam's understanding of the singularity? <clears throat> As I've shown, this wouldn't be a law without precedent, a law that demands that communities wrestle with the implications of the commandment, but not be bound by them. In fact, I would argue a slavish devotion to the commandment as it appears textually would almost certainly be a case of reintroducing mythic violence. Perhaps the greatest irony of this is, what, is that while the commandment appears to condemn all forms of killing, the mythic appropriation of this law kills all the time, whereas a more anarchic approach, as I've been suggesting here, would actually kill much less, if at all. There could be no absolute decision on this question, as each time the question would be reiterated anew. This might not look like law at all insofar as we are thoroughly schooled in thinking of law in particular in a mythic fashion. But I would caution us not to throw out the term law altogether, for to do so would be to vitiate the power of the commandment and precisely its ability to turn us to our own judgment. It seems to me that left entirely to our own devices, it would be far too easy for mythic violence to sneak back in and order our decisions in the guise of some great sweeping secularity. That is arguably what has happened to law as Benjamin describes it. Or more accurately, perhaps we, we would need the devices of the commandment in order to actually be left to our own devices. We need a manifestation of God to combat the lies mythic violence tells us about God, but a manifestation of God that tells us nothing else. That manifestation has to look a certain way. It has to make commandments. It has to claim that authority. But in this reading, it uses that authority to unmake itself, leaving us finally free to make our own decisions without recourse to truth, God, or nature at all. That to me is a basis for legal anarchism and for the singularity as such. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so our final speaker um, is uh, Hector Castaño, um, whose paper uh, paper is entitled Singularity and Translation and the Economy of Cultural Difference. Yeah, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, I want to wish Sam a happy birthday. Um, we haven't met uh, since uh, my soutenance at uh, Nanterre. So it was almost uh, three years ago, ago, I think. So exactly, exactly three years ago. So I really uh, want to thank uh, Julia, James, and Jörg for organizing this encounter and um, giving me the chance of uh, to see uh, and hear Sam and also some friends uh, from the Paris program as well. Now, let me uh, first give you some context about what I'm going to say. Uh, when I met Sam a uh, few years ago, I was a PhD student in Paris working on Derrida, uh, corporality, phenomenology, and other related topics. 
under the supervision of uh, Peter Sandy, who is uh, also here, I think. Uh, at the time, I uh, had a very uh, private interest in China, uh, completely unrelated to my research. Uh, and Sam, or Monsieur Weber, as I'm still used to call him in, in French, uh, Sam, on the contrary, had already um, read a lot about Chinese history and literature and sinology. And in fact, he was uh, particularly um, attentive to those moments in which uh, the question of China emerged in the texts of Derrida, uh, uh, for example. And in a series of conversations that we had at the uh, Café Nemrod uh, in the uh, uh, uh in Paris, he encouraged me to transform my uh, initial interest into a long-term uh, research project, and uh, so, so I did. Uh, but there is a second, perhaps even more important aspect of uh, Sam's encouragement. So it is obvious from all uh, previous interventions that his work has been decisive in shaping the way in which we all uh, consider the problem of uh, singularity. In his uh, French book, uh, Enquêtant Singularité, uh, published in uh, 2014, he studied singularity not as a pure concept, but in its complicated relationship uh, to history, uh, to Western traditions, and to pre present social and political issues. At that time in Europe, we were still uh, suffering from the consequences of the uh, sovereign debt crisis. And for some, uh, singularity also brought about the possibility of reconsidering uh, the economy of the debt that was ravaging uh, the welfare state, especially in Southern Europe. And in a uh, short uh, footnote of, of the book, he suggested the possibility of an economy where the singular incommensurability of things and not their absolute equivalence in terms of money, for instance, uh, is the measure of the exchange, an economy of uh, non-equivalence capable of accepting the fact that infinite debts can never be paid back. The context today is slightly different. We are now facing a global health crisis, which obviously is not simply a health crisis, but also a, an economical and technological and uh, geopolitical one. A crisis uh, of some of the models of world that have coexisted in the context of so-called uh, globalization. In this new crisis of today, today we assist to the emergence of uh, another kind of debts. We call, call them narrative debts. Where did the virus start? Who reacted first? Who was the first to help others with sanitary material? Who owes what? to whom, and so on. All those are questions um, aiming at reshaping uh, the narrative of the crisis, or at counting or recounting its catastrophic uh, consequences, as Sam says in an essay published online a couple of months ago. Uh, recounting the plague is the name of uh, this essay. In this essay, Sam also underlines one aspect of the virus. It is relational. And it establishes its relations mainly with pre-existing conditions, with the pre-existing health conditions of its victims, of course, but also I would say with pre-existing conditions such as cultural nationalism, nation state and sovereignty, global capitalism, and so on. Those pre-existing conditions somehow suggest that the plague can never simply come from the outside and that it challenges all simple narratives of its origin. The critical job that consists in reconsidering these narratives about the origins of the crisis cannot be limited to taking them as mere uh, fictions. And in the same essay, uh, Sam also relates the exercise of recounting, not just to fiction, but to what he calls friction, the point in which uh, fiction and its narrators uh, touch elements of reality, uh, preserving and transforming them. I think that uh, there are pre-existing conditions also in more or less traditional discourses about cultural difference. And in what follows by approaching the current situation in these terms, 
I don't want to reduce the complexity of the crisis to what actually is just one of its dimensions, uh, the cultural one. But cultures and cultural differences or culturally based political differences are coming with a strong force to the market of coronavirus narratives. We hear very often uh, speak about why and how Asian societies, for example, have resisted so well the virus. And then experts evoke, uh, for instance, the sense of collectivity, uh, the Confucian values, and so on. By contrast to uh, individualism or even democracy as being the main reasons why the virus is out of control in the West. I wouldn't say that there isn't a part of truth in this kind of analysis, but they are also too vague. If we still remember what happened in Wuhan uh, between January and April of this year, the key words of its narrative are also state, police, and technology. From this perspective, the crisis gives us an opportunity to consider some of the pre-existing conditions at the level of what I mentioned uh, in the title of this talk as the economy of cultural difference. It is a long and complicated story, uh, but in the process of narrating of it today, I'm convinced that uh, we can get a lot of inspiration from Sam's work and especially from his thoughts on singularity and translation. In order to summarize the problem, uh, culture and cultural difference are often considered in terms of specific difference, of particularity and not of singularity. Both in academic and in political discourses, an economy of difference plays the card of incommensurability in order to determine the value of otherness in a certain appropriable sense. For instance, as a secret that only those who belong to a certain cultural community are able to feel or to understand. That is, as an absolutely untranslatable secret, like the mysterious uh, Confucian values that I just mentioned. Analyzing the question of singularity in the context of the monotheological paradigm, Sam also discusses Benjamin's ideas on translation in order to show how problematic the notion of origin can be and how a certain practice of translation destabilized the framework of a given language or a given culture as closed totalities. My point would be the same applies to other cultural contexts as well, outside the monotheological paradigm. To take again the example of China, for a certain time already, a great amount of intellectual activity has been invested in creating a narrative that flows without interruption since a mythical origin uh, 5,000 years ago. Needless to say, uh, the conditions uh, for or the condition for this narrative is its differentiation with respect to other concurrent block narratives, uh, such as the European civilization, for instance. And the condition for this uh, differentiation is to identify the, com the commonalities as well. So we all have the printing press, but I invented mine before you, not to speak about uh, gunpowder. But in fact, this form of exchange constitutes also the way in which the West used to dream of China of, or, or, or East Asia in general, as the historical mm -hmm. form of its radical mm -hmm. otherness. Uh, the West, uh, this way, uh, refuses to acknowledge the historical complexity and the heterogeneous singularities of China in order to be able to identify itself. And then a uh, uh, self-assertive China grasps the chance to further raise its difference with regards to Xinjiang, Tibet, and also Hong Kong or uh, Taiwan. Now, if there is a singularity to come and to be thought beyond the dangers of autoimmunity or beyond the political sovereignty and even beyond uh, metaphysics of origin, of the origin, the singularity won't come from China today, at least not in the sense in which Derrida, perhaps uh, a little bit ironically, seemed to locate in China the outside of all logocentrism in, uh, of grammatology. No, or yes. The great chance for singularity lies uh, in a certain practice of translation, precisely the kind of translation embraced by Sam that challenges the homogeneity and university of the source text of the original and of the origin. Of course, in translation, there is always the risk of generalization, either in the form of universality or in the form of, of particularity. 
another recent example that has been the object of surprisingly uh, quite a lot of attention in Western political uh, philosoph philosophy is the translation of uh, the cosmos of uh, cosmopolitanism into the Chinese notion of Tianxia, uh, which is sometimes translated as all, all under heaven, in order to imagine a global order which is basically the same, so absolutely translatable, but with its center no longer in the West, but somewhere else in the East. So that it is, uh, that is also untranslatable, so radically different. In this context, I think that we uh, can get inspiration from uh, Sam's reflection on an economy based on the incommensurability of singularities. In order to rethink uh, this economy of cultural difference, and even of course to think about difference beyond the concept of culture. What if what we share is precisely that which differentiates us, singularity? That is what distinguishes one from another, but also the one from the one and the other from the other. Um, since our last conversation at the, at the uh, Café Nemrod, uh, Sam has uh, uh, kept uh, reading on China, I, I imagine, and has also traveled there uh, at least one more time. So I would like to know how he feels about all these questions, uh, what has he observed, and what future does he uh, see for singularity in the context of this specific sense of the exchange that I have just evoked. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all of you for um, extraordinarily rich papers. Um, I myself have so much to say about all this, but I'm, I'm not gonna jump right in. <laughs> I just wanna open it up to everybody else. Um, anybody have, um, anybody wanna be the first to raise a question? Uh, if not, I can I can actually jump in just to jumpstart um, uh, a question that I had, especially uh, listening to Hector's um, uh, presentation. Um, you know, being extraordinarily ambivalent about what Derrida says about China and the grammatology, but also not being alone in that estimation. Obviously, I also wonder um, about the when you said about the paradigm for sort of. Um, Better understanding what's going on with within like ethno nationalistic China, at least it's in, it, in itself understanding, um, and that's um, I feel like you know there, a lot of the discourse around sort of origins and also um, the econ like economies of cultural difference, especially when it comes to um, uh, uh, global sort of um, political economic relations and sort of like the attempt to shift centers of power or, um, uh, here and there have to do with a kind of nostalgia for um, a uh, situation in China where it's just opened up enough for there to be some sort of sense of access. And I, and like that aspect isn't really touched on uh, such within the purely Confucian principles, I feel like with, with regard to like Tianxia and um, Lesha, it's, you know, and, and I guess the specific question I have is like, where do you see then, um, you know, the concurrent nurturing of entrepreneurship that's been going on in China since the 1980s um, as also like a counter narrative within, I mean, a possible source of counter narrative within China itself. You know, a lot of the rural experimentation, um, especially starting with Deng Xiaoping, et cetera. I mean, some of it reversed in the interim, but nevertheless, there's more than one sort of narrative within China that constitutes what China's self-image is. Um, how do you see that in relationship to, um, you know, the problem of, um, you know, the, the, the purchase of like the, uh, an economy of uh, cultural difference um, based on the notion of singularity as you so nicely laid out? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Well, I'll just give a, a, a very simple answer. I think that it is important we're talking about China and talking about all this problem of this uh, uh, nationalist narrative and self-affirmation and, and so on is uh, to pay attention to uh, the heterogeneity that uh, coexists with these uh, kind of narratives. And I think that if we uh, want to uh, think of uh, a possibility uh, within the framework of this uh, idea of singularity in translation, I think that uh, a good example would be uh, the beginning of the 20th century and uh, precisely all the work of translation of Western concepts 
uh, all the work uh, uh, in the direction of the development of uh, um, transcultural self-consciousness in, in the context, for instance, of, of, of the um, uh, um, um, of the uh, main force movement and, and so on. So um, yeah, that will be, uh, I think, a, a, a possibility of, of, for this analysis. Then, uh, of course, we can also find uh, counter narratives that are not only uh, specifically uh, Chinese or developed within China, but also in the uh, frontiers uh, of, of, of China in uh, Sinophone debates, but also within the translation between uh, 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 China and the West. And I think another example that I personally um, have uh, done some research on will be uh, the discussions on, uh, on philosophical Taoism and in particular on this classic text, uh, the Chuangzi, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the context of a debate between Taiwan and, the, and, the, and, and, and some French uh, sinologists and philosophers, so French speaking sinologists or philosophers like uh, Jean-François Biguete. So that will be another another possibility. I think there are lots of of, of, of possibilities for developing this kind of of uh, of, of analysis. I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'll raise a question to, to, to uh, not have silence. So it's a, it's, it's a relative to this, uh, the same question that uh, Julia asked in reverse or some different with respect to James's uh, presentation. And it involves the translation of the word kill. So it's, it's not German, Töten in German. What's the status of that translation? But Benjamin is enacting the translation in the very uh, text that you refer to in the Critique of Violence. And what do you think, what, what's happening there? It does seem as though you're presenting it as though it's all one language, um, but you know it's not. Yeah. Benjamin doesn't gesture towards the translation issue, and that itself is worth thinking about. And uh, you know, where is killing not killing? Mm. What does killing mean? Mm. Such that it can be translated from one text to another, and it's in a divine voice, which would apparently speak to everyone, but also only singularly. Yeah. So what does kill mean? That's that's such a beautiful question. So profound. It it really does it really does speak to me about the singularity of language because of course, whatever we are talking about has to appear in some word in some language, right? Whether it's in Hebrew or German or English or any other language, and uh, of course we think we know what it means because we think we know what it means in our language. But exactly as you said, and Benjamin's task of the translator, of course, makes this point that translation kind of shows you what's always true even in your own language. Um, which is that words are never really pointing to what you think they are. And so they're always a singularity. They're always, each time you say the word, it's just like the commandment, right? Each time you say the word, it doesn't mean the same thing. It means what it means in that moment. But we kind of create a thread of, of uh, consistency as if, as if it always meant exactly the same thing at all times. And I think Benjamin is very aware of that. I'm not sure how he could express that textually exactly because it, it just appears in text and appears in whatever language and we sort of feel bound by that. But I think his entire work and Sam really helps me to understand how this happens is meant to undermine that sense. And if you'll forgive the very strange analogy I'm about to make, this always reminds me of Judith Butler's uh, gender trouble when, when she said that when she sees drag queens, she sees the gender performance that we all do, right? It's just more obvious with, with people in drag, but the most heteronormative person is also in drag, you know, and also performing their gender. And so same with language, right? When we see translation helps us understand that the word kill doesn't mean the word kill when we see it, you know, next to another word in a different language. But it's also true inside of English or in German or in Hebrew, that that's also always true. It's just hard, it's just we don't always think that because we, are, we, remain, we remain sort of, you know, committed to language and to the truths that we think it tells. So that's, that's why I think the idea of singularity is so exciting and helpful in this.
So thank you for that question. Uh, thank you. Um, other questions? Um, if not, then I, I, I myself actually have another question for um, Javier, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, Liu Tia in The Different proposes a solution to the problem that you were describing um, about the um, problem of intradiscursive difference, um, which otherwise is manifested in, in The Different as the liar's paradox. Um, by um, resolving it by introducing a temporal shift. So that as actually James was just saying, um, the solution to this, the Lyers paradox is that you're not saying necessarily the same thing each time you're saying it. There is a temporal, like there's a difference between T, T0, T1, T2. Um, I'm just wondering how, you know, given, you know, you were, you were talking about like, you know, early versus late Lyotard, like, speculating on, you know, what changed, what not. Um, how this maybe um, sits with um, your um, recounting of um, Sam's notion of singularity and his critique of Lyotard. You mean, uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify, you, you mean that that, that is Lyotard's, um, Lyotard's response to the problem of heterogeneity in the Deforan to go to this temporality, to the, yeah. to the temporality dimension of the phrase. Um, well, I think that is actually more. Um, I think Leo, if I, if I will have to say where Lyotard wants to find the solution to to this sort of political impasse that we have discursive heterogeneity and therefore apparently no universalist politics, um, it's actually so. Lyotard would go to Kant sublime, I think, and to say, well, it is in the fraction of the discourses. Um, because every phrase involves a discursive fraction, and this fraction is taking place all the time. When there is a fraction, and the model for this fraction is Kant sublime, and the fraction between uh, reason and the imagination, um, there's always the possibility of a universal injunction when this happens. And it's universal because it always happens. It cannot not happen. So anything that happens involves this fraction, and then the author wants to develop a notion of universality on this basis. And I think this is different than the direction that Sam takes specifically in the afterword, but, but also in Sam's understanding of singular, singularity. This is why I said, I think it's more uh, micro-political because it's not, it, it's, it's not universality in the sense in the sense that Lyotard wants to you know, turn to Kant's notion of the sublime. Um, it's a, if, if I understand correctly what Sam is doing in the afterward, it is sort of instances that show that the game is always in play. And these instances are always singular, um, but they show a condition, also a condition that it, of everything that is, which is that, um, well, these discursive formations and this interrelation is always uh, in dispute. It's a different solution for me because I think it's always local. Whereas Lyotard wants to say, well, there is actually moments that expose something um, universal. That is a condition that everything that is. Um, yeah, that's all I can say for now. It's obviously much more, <laughs> much more complicated. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're over time a bit, um, but um, is there maybe one final question that we can raise? Yeah, James. Uh, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, I have a question for Marion, actually. Um, and uh, Marion, I, re I really, uh, really so appreciated your talk and thought it was really telling. And when you were talking about the bell curve, I've always thought of the bell curve as this kind of procrustean device that rather than sort of actually map human beings in a natural bell curve. It forces human beings into a bell curve. And I was actually thinking of that horrible racist book. I don't know if you're aware of it from maybe 20 years ago called The Bell Curve, which was, which was all about, which was saying that, you know, white people are smarter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I didn't know what you thought about that, like about the sort of the, the dark history of the bell curve and, its, uh, and the violence that it inflicts on all of us, including students who, of course, you're graded on a curve. It kind of does the same procrustean motions. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
I should have, I mean, I'd heard of the book, but I've not read it. No, I mean, I, I'm, the trouble is the moment you try and put this in time, this bell curve in which your statistics fall, um, you, you, you expect it. And that's where the, that's where the violence can come. It's, you know, I started off by um, that paper of Sam's in which he talks about the word gewalt. And I was thinking around the way in which this, um, the, this use of statistics can exactly impose um, uh, patterns which then perpetuate. Um, so what I, th what I think is odd about um, Ketley um, and which the mathematicians, I mean, because he, he wasn't a serious mathematician, but he was a good mathematician, which the mathematicians don't really like, is that why did he start thinking about the permanence of proportions? Well, it's because he studied fine arts in his teens and he spent time measuring statues. <laughs> and it wasn't that he was thinking a human body is a statue, but he was very much concerned with what you could use that kind of proportion of measurement of statues. And when you reiterated them, um, what happens to those measurements? And it's from that that some of the, um, the uh, well, I think I can show it actually, but that's another matter. It's from that that some of his work on picking out the draft dodgers, for example, derives. So I suppose what I, what I find rather concerning is that, I mean, we need statistics um, just to run ourselves, but there's something very, sometimes something very disquieting, not merely when you look at the historical origins of it, um, but actually it's sort of intellectual justification, I would say. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's answered you. It, Probably. Does. it does, thank you. Okay, um, so um, since it's um, 50, um, I have London time in front of me, but 1852 in London, I guess. Um, we're, we're a bit over time, but so um, let me just um, maybe uh, close the session, thanking everybody involved, and uh, suggest that we return in about seven minutes. Hopefully that's enough time. Um, uh, in time for uh, Sam to um, give us all what he, a piece of his thoughts. Okay. Uh, see everybody shortly. <laughs>